Good evening, everyone. Uh, I've read this so many times, you'd think I'd have it memorized by now, but, but I don't. So uh, I'm going to be reading off my, uh, my, my little uh, uh, script here. Um, so for tonight, I've chosen a topic I'm often reminded of. I call it, how am I walking today? Uh, physically, I praise God, I, I can walk. I can walk all day. And it wasn't that long ago, I actually had to use a walker to help me walk. So I don't take walking for granted. But that's not the kind of walk um, I want to share with you tonight. What I'm talking about is my Christian walk. How to walk a life that's pleasing and honoring to God. Why the Christian walk? Well, simply put, it's the evidence of my faith. James writes in his epistle uh, 2, 14 to 18, What good is it, dear brothers and sisters, if you say you have faith, but don't show it by your actions? Can that kind of faith save anyone? Suppose you see a brother or sister who has no food or clothing, and you say, goodbye, have a good day, stay warm and eat well. But then you don't give that person any food or clothing. What good does that do? So you see, faith by itself isn't enough. Unless it produces good deeds, it is dead and useless. Now, someone may argue, some people have faith, others have good deeds. But I say, how can you show me your faith if you don't have good deeds? I will show you my faith by my good deeds. James answers the why by saying to put our faith into action. Paul puts it like this in Colossians 1, 8 to 10. He's referring to Epaphras as his uh, beloved co-worker here. Epaphras, who also declared to us, your love in the spirit. For this reason, we also, since the day we heard it, do not cease to pray for you and to ask that you may be filled with the knowledge of his will in all wisdom and spiritual understanding, that you may walk worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing him, being fruitful in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God. Paul basically answers the why in verse 10. To walk worthy of the Lord, to fully please him, to be fruitful, and to increase in the knowledge of God. So how do we do the Christian walk? Uh, we're not meant to do this on our own strength. We need God's help. The good news is God has given us a helper. As the Lord prepared, prepared his disciples of his departure, he promised them God the Father would send them a helper to lead and guide them into all truth. His Holy Spirit. Not just to them, but to all future believers. As believers, his Spirit dwells in us to help us. Paul's in Romans 8, 10 to 11, says this, If Christ is in you, though the body is dead because of sin, yet the Spirit is alive because of righteousness. But if the Spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ Jesus from the dead will also give you life to your mortal bodies through his Spirit who dwells in you. But God's Spirit does more than just live in us. It's also the power of God in us. Peter puts it this way. 2 Peter 1.3 By his divine power, God has given us everything we need 
for living a godly life. The Spirit is not the doer, though. God gave us free will to be the doer. Sorry, God gave us free will to be the doer because God will not for, force us to do anything. God didn't make robots. So what is the Christian walk? Paul describes the qualities of a spirit-filled walk or spirit-filled life this way in Galatians 5, 23 But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things there is no law. Paul outlines nine qualities here. An interesting tidbit, which I haven't picked up before, is that Paul uses fruit in the singular. He doesn't say the fruits, each being a fruit of its own. Because the fruit is meant to be the work of the Spirit in our lives, which then produces these these qualities. These, they are the byproducts of the fruit. And we're meant to have all of it. Love being the first one is not a coincidence. This is how Paul puts it in 1 Corinthians 13. If I could speak all the languages of earth and of angels, but did not love others, I would only be a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. If I had the gift of prophecy, and if I understood all of God's secret plans and possessed all knowledge, and if I had such faith that I could move mountains, but did not love others, I would be nothing. If I gave everything I have to the poor and even sacrificed my body, I could boast about it. But if I didn't love others, I would have gained nothing. Paul says, if you don't have love, you have nothing. But if you do have love, everything else follows. To live out these qualities, though, it's important to have a general sense of what each, one's, what each quality means. Love, this is a translation of the Greek word agape that Paul would have used. It is a deliberate decision to love those whom we don't think are deserving of it. This is a selfless, sacrificial love. There's no better example of this of God himself who came down from heaven to become flesh so he could take the penalty for our sins, to forgive, to reconcile us with God forever. Joy, this is not happiness, even though happiness may bring you joy. Happiness is temporary, usually driven by circumstances which don't last. Joy is a state of mind, of contentment, whether things are good or bad, to remain joyful. Paul remained joyful, whether he had much or little, or beaten up and in prison. Luke 10, 10 20 sums it up nicely. But rather rejoice because your names are written in heaven. Peace, sure, we ought to be peaceful and not seek trouble, but it's also an inner peace within, a heart that's at peace. The Lord said in John 14 27, I am leaving you with a gift peace of mind and heart, and the peace I give is a gift the world cannot give. So don't be troubled or afraid. Patience also means perseverance. And one of the great examples of perseverance is the story of Job. Despite the incredible amount of suffering he endured, his wife offered him no support. His friends likewise turned on him, accused him of wrongdoing, and blamed his own sins for his predicament. 
Yet, Job endured. He waited and was eventually restored. Waiting doesn't always give us what we want, though, but we endure and wait. Paul says in Romans 5, 4, and, and endurance develops strength of character, and character strengthens our confident hope of salvation, and this hope will not lead to disappointment. Next is kindness. But I'll touch on goodness first because goodness nicely ties into kindness. Goodness is knowing it's the right thing to do, even if it comes at a cost, and it usually does. The parable of the Good Samaritan best illustrates this. He knew it was the right thing to help out the man who had been beaten up and left for dead. The man was probably a Jew, and yet it was a Samaritan who helped him. Now, kindness is acting out on the goodness. The Samaritan acted on it. He not only cared for the victim when he encountered the situation, he made sure the victim was looked after while he recovered. He then returned later to check on him, made sure the innkeeper, innkeeper was compensated. The Lord says, that's loving your neighbor. Faithfulness is trustworthiness. The Lord is surely faithful. No one is more trustworthy than God. To quote Hebrews 6.18, God has given us both his promise and his oath. These two things are unchangeable because it is impossible for God to lie. Therefore, we who have fled to him for refuge can have great confidence as we hold to the hope that lies before us. Gentleness, I think, is synonymous to humility. It is not, to ha not having a superior attitude, not being boastful, not looking down on others because we think we're better, but being compassionate and caring towards others. There's no greater humility than what Paul writes in Philippians, uh, Philippians 2.6.7. Though he was God, he did not think of equality with God as something to cling to. Instead, he gave up his divine privileges. He took the humble position of a slave and was born as a human being. Self-control is having the discipline to let the spirit lead and not give in to our sinful nature. In our culture today, the temptations are many, small ones, big ones, the devil tempts. He wants us to submit to his rule. He is the ruler of this world because God has allowed it. But James writes in 4.7, So humble yourselves before God. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. That's the end of the nine qualities. And I guess now you want to know how, how am I walking today? Well, I can tell you it's definitely a work in progress. I do better on some, and some days are better than others. It's not an easy walk. Paul himself struggled with his sinful nature, as he writes in Romans 7, 18, 19. He says, And I know that nothing good lives in me. That is, in my sinful nature. I want to do what is right, but I can't. I want to do what is good, but I don't. I don't want to do what is wrong, but I do it anyway. If Paul struggled, it can't be that easy. But I keep walking towards the finish line. Paul compares life to a race. A marathon, really. But to know we've been saved by grace, not works. And as Paul wrote, as Paul wrote to the Philippians in 1.6, And I am certain that God, who began the good work within you, will continue his work until it is finally finished on the day when Christ Jesus returns. 
And that's the end of my little message tonight. On time, too. <laughs>